it's crucial that people understand sort of what the stakes are, what tools we have, what tools do our adversaries have, and relatively speaking, how capable they are. Hello, I am from the Air Force Wargaming Institute here at Maxwell Air Force Base, Alabama. I would like to introduce you to an exciting new game we've developed called Air Force Wargame Indo-Pacific, or AFWI. I recommend you watch this video with the game components and the instructions available for easy reference. Pause as you need to, I'll still be here when you come back. AFWI is a near future tactical to low operational game set in the Indo-Pacific theater. This game showcases the impact multi-domain actions such as cyber, space, maritime, and air. It is designed to serve as an introduction to Air Force Wargaming, demonstrating the basic tenets of air power and multi-domain combat. The game will use one of the predefined campaign scenarios located on the last page of the player guide, or can be used for free play or user-defined scenarios. The campaign will tell you how many air tasking order cycles the game will consist of, and we will cover that later. Now let's take a look at the game components. The complete list of components can be found in the player guide. First, you have one game board, 54 US cards, 54 PRC cards, 30 blue US air unit tokens, two blue US ground unit tokens, two blue US maritime unit tokens, 28 red PRC air unit tokens, two red PRC ground unit tokens, three red PRC maritime unit tokens, two blue and two red cylinders, 20 blue and 20 red cubes, and finally, four D4 four-sided die. Let's cover each of those items one by one. The game board consists of a game map with range bands and basing areas for the United States and the People's Republic of China, PRC. The U.S. basing area includes a contingency location container simulating agile combat employment ACE operations. Squadrons placed in the contingency location are considered geographically separated from all other squadrons in the contingency location. Additionally, each side has a standoff container where certain airborne assets can be employed. Each side also has a cyber track and an intel track. Ranges on the game board are an abstracted, unspecified distance. Ranges on the tokens refer to the range bands on the game board. Each side has a set of game cards made up of four types, mission, posture, squadron, and enabler. The campaign you select before the game should help guide your selection of mission and posture cards. Mission cards capture the objective of the campaign and tell how the player will score victory points. Each side has five different mission cards. Let's take a closer look at the attrition mission card. The mission is to destroy enemy units. Next is the posture card. Players select posture cards at the beginning of each ATO cycle. These cards shape the fight for that cycle. Players may not select the same posture card used during a previous ATO cycle except for the standard posture, which may always be selected. As you can see, the enabler card shows you how many enabler and squadron cards you have for that ATO cycle. Additionally, the card describes any restrictions or bonuses associated with that posture. Squadron cards are next, and they represent units that have been deployed into theater for the conflict. The number of squadrons that will participate in the ATO cycle is shown on the posture card. The cards have unit name, a picture of the type of equipment, unit patch, and a brief description. Each card also has a picture of counter spaces, with more on that later, and the number of assets in the squadron, as well as which band on the board they deploy to. Don't worry, this will all come together during the playthrough. Each squadron has a set of tokens to generate. We will cover these as we go through game setup. 
Now, let's take a look at the enabler cards. Enabler cards are used to deploy multi-domain operational effects into the battle space. These include maritime, land, space, cyber, special operations forces, and additional air effects. Next, we have the wooden cubes and cylinders. These are used to track actions and capabilities. We will show you how to use these markers during the gameplay. One last thing before we go into game setup, the dice. These are used to determine move outcomes. Basic moves use only one die. However, you can deploy effects or be subject to effects your opponent deploys that cause you to roll at an advantage or a disadvantage. When rolling at an advantage, you will select two dice and roll them and choose the higher of the two numbers. When rolling at a disadvantage, you will roll two dice and select the lower of the two numbers. You will see this as the game progresses. We've now covered the basics. Let's proceed to gameplay. The bid for initiative determines who takes the first turn and the winner gains intel advantage and the opportunity to attempt to increase their cyber rate. Let's explore each of these mechanics a little further. In the bid for initiative, each player will roll 1d4. The player with the higher number now gains initiative and has an intel advantage and may move their intel track marker to advantage on the board. Reroll any ties until there is a single winner. The winning player will then determine who will take the first turn during that ATO. Each side starts with a cyber rate of 1. The player with initiative will then roll one die. If the value is at or greater than the next cyber access value listed on the board, they may then increase their cyber rate by 1. Players can also increase their cyber rate using specific enabler cards during ATO gameplay. Achieve a cyber rate of 4, and you win the game instantly. Now, both players will roll to determine how many of their opponent's enabler cards they may see before that ATO. The player with an intel advantage will roll two dice and choose the higher number, while the other player will only roll one. Players may then choose one enabler card to withhold from view regardless of the dice rolls and show their opponent the number of enabler cards up to the number of the dice roll. Then, players will conduct a series of actions each turn until either one player has all tokens and squadrons eliminated or when both players choose to pass or are unable to conduct future attacks. At the end of the ATO, any surviving tokens or squadrons will return to their respective players and may be used in subsequent ATO cycles unless their squadron card has been destroyed. The overall game ends once all ATO cycles are complete, as dictated by the campaign selected. At that time, each player will reveal their mission card and tally their victory points. The player with the most victory points wins the game. Now that we have a baseline understanding of the rules, let's dive into explaining how each turn works. Each turn begins with a choice as to whether to play a single enabler card or to hold them for future use. This step is not required as the best strategy may be to wait for forces to become available or game board conditions to change. Remember, some enabler cards can be played at any time regardless of whose turn it is. Once you have either taken the actions directed on the card or declined to play an enabler card, you may now choose from one of two options. The first option is to generate forces from their basic location according to the squadron card. Players may only generate one squadron each turn. Importantly, some squadrons specify a band where the squadron must deploy its tokens while others allow more flexibility to incorporate player strategy. When a squadron is generated, 
the squadron card is turned over and becomes visible to the opponent. The tokens are then deployed to the appropriate range band and placed face down. We will have more on this later. If a blue player is generating from the contingency location, they must now roll one die to determine how many tokens will generate. If the number on the die is lower than the number of assets in the squadron, the remaining tokens will stay grounded for the duration of the ATO and remain vulnerable to attack. Should you choose to generate a squadron at your primary airbase or contingency location, your turn is now over. If you do not decide to generate forces, you may now choose to conduct some or all of a move acquire shoot sequence. These steps may be conducted in any order. Let's break each action down a little further. The move step allows a player to move one token. To move a token, first examine the token's move range listed with the move icon. This is the upper limit of how many range bands that token may move during that turn. Then, move the token the desired amount of range bands on the game board. After one token is moved, the move step is complete. The next possible action is to acquire unidentified aerial targets for future attack. For this, a player must first examine the acquiring asset's range, any potential modifiers, and the number of rolls by looking at the acquiring asset's game token. Then, the player will roll one or two dice to attempt to acquire the new target. If the number rolled exceeds the number listed on the back of the targeted token, that token is now acquired and will be flipped over to expose it to future attacks. Advanced and stealth aircraft offer unique challenges for acquisition, so consider leveraging these assets during gameplay. After one attempt to acquire an asset, or two for a limited number of high-value aerial tokens, the acquire step is over for that turn. The final step during the move acquire shoot sequence is to shoot either a ground or acquired aerial target. For this step, players must first determine the attacking token's capabilities as listed on the face of the token. Some tokens may only be used to target air tokens, others only ground tokens or squadrons and some have the capabilities to attack both types of tokens. Next, determine the range limits of the attack also listed on the token. Lastly, players will choose an enemy token within the identified attack's limits and roll one or two dice to conduct the attack. For aerial attacks, if the number rolled meets or exceeds the value listed inside the die icon on the attacking asset's token, then the enemy token is destroyed and is removed from the board for scoring. Importantly, aerial targets must first be acquired before they can be attacked. The number rolled for attack is also used to determine if the attacking asset remains available for future attacks or if it no longer has ammunition and must return to base at the beginning of the next turn. Tokens that are out of ammunition are determined to be Winchester and are identified on the board by placing a blue cube on the token or turning the token sideways. For all assets except the attack UAS, the token will only have ammunition for future attacks with a dice roll of 4 for the attack. Any die rolls less than four drive the token Winchester. For attack UAS tokens, any die rolls less than three drive the token Winchester and force it to return to base prior to the next turn. Winchester tokens may still be targeted for points prior to their return to base. If airborne tokens are Winchester and their squadron card has been destroyed at the airbase or contingency location, then the Winchester token reverts to enemy control for scoring instead of returning to base. All destroyed tokens and reverted tokens will not regenerate for the rest of the game and may not be used in future ATO cycles unless an appropriate enabler card is played. For ground attacks, the same attacking and Winchester rules apply. 
The key difference is that attacking tokens with an exploding die icon will roll again after the attack to determine the amount of damage to ground tokens or squadrons. Advantage or disadvantage rules do not apply for damage rolls unless missile defense is employed or the appropriate enabler card has been played. Then, players will indicate levels of damage to ground targets by placing one cube on the board for each number rolled. When a ground token or card has been destroyed, it is removed from the board for scoring. If the squadron card includes tokens that have not been generated, the tokens are also removed for scoring. Striking units before they generate can be challenging but offers the potential for high rewards. Aerial assets that do not have exploding die icons can only inflict one damage point to any ground unit. Missile defense plays a crucial role in this game and is used most often for ground attacks. Tokens capable of missile defense can engage attacks that enter their weapon engagement zone. This alters the probability of hits and damage rolls, adding an extra layer of strategy. Players must select missile defense squadrons before the ATO or employ sea-based missile defense tokens using enabler cards during the game. To employ its effects, defending players must have generated the squadron during a prior turn and declare missile defense before any attack rolls. Both the attack roll and damage roll, if applicable, are now at disadvantage. Missile defense tokens and squadrons are also vulnerable to ground attacks, but do not go Winchester. In addition to defending against attacks, some missile defense tokens also have the ability to acquire targets within their identified range during a move acquire shoot sequence. Now, let's walk through one ATO cycle designed to demonstrate many of the mechanics we discussed. For this demonstration, both the US and PRC are playing the attrition mission and standard posture. Although in normal gameplay, each side would only know each other's posture, with each side keeping their mission card hidden until all ATO cycles are complete. Since both players have chosen the standard posture, each side chooses four squadrons to deploy face down and six enabler cards, keeping their choices concealed from their opponent. Next, both players roll one die to determine who has the initiative. For this example, the PRC, or red player, rolls a 3 and the US, or blue player, rolls a 2. Red now has the initiative and moves their intel track to advantage. The red player has also decided to move first during each turn of the ATO. Now, the red player rolls one die to determine if they can increase their cyber rate. Remember, only the player who has initiative will take this roll. In this example, red rolls a 3, which meets or exceeds their next cyber access value. Red will now increase their cyber rate by 1. Next, both players roll to determine how many of their opponent's enabler cards they can see. The red player rolls two dice at advantage since they achieve the initiative. For this demonstration, red rolls a 4 and a 1. Since they roll with advantage, they can now see four of the U.S. cards. The blue player rolls one die, which comes up three. The blue player can now see three of the red player's enabler cards. Prior to showing their enabler cards, each player can choose one enabler card to withhold from view regardless of the die rolls, since intelligence is never perfect. Since Red has the initiative and decided to play first, they can now choose whether to play an enabler card and then choose their desired action for this turn. Red chooses to play their Badger Surge enabler card, putting H6 bomber rolls at advantage for the duration of this ATO. This is a single-use card with enduring effects that can only be used during this ATO and will then be removed from the deck for future ATOs. Additionally, Red chooses to generate their H6 bomber to the standoff container. The H6 squadron card is then flipped over and the H6 token is moved and placed face down until acquired. 
since the standoff container is essentially a sixth range band and the H6 ground attack range is six, this means the H6 can now attack blue ground targets while rolling at advantage on the next turn and beyond. Since red chose to generate, their turn is now over. For blue's first turn, they choose to play the Improved Munitions Enabler card, another single-use card with enduring effects, to make all U.S. air-to-air -air attack rolls to be at advantage for this ATO. The blue player similarly chooses to generate this turn, activating their Attack UAS Squadron. Attack UASs have the special ability to generate to any range band. In this demonstration, the blue player chooses to generate them to blue band 5, putting them within striking distance of red ground tokens and cards. The collective red and blue turn 1 is now complete. Each side will continue taking turns until one side has all tokens and squadrons destroyed or both players choose to pass or are unable to conduct future strikes with remaining assets. For turn 2, Red chooses to play their single-use hypersonic missile card to conduct an unblockable attack against the main U.S. base. This means no squadrons or tokens designated for missile defense can intercept the weapon. Red now rolls one die to determine damage. Red rolls a two, meaning it can now inflict two damage points. For ground attacks against the primary airbase, damage points can be dispersed amongst multiple units. For ground attacks at the contingency location, only one unit may be attacked in any single turn. In this case, Red chooses to use both damage points against one B-52 squadron that has yet to generate eliminating the grounded aircraft as well. But, prior to removing the squadron and token, the blue player chooses to play the Resilient Bases Enabler card, a single-use card that can be played at any time immediately after a PRC attack to cancel all damage. This essentially nullifies the hypersonic missile attack. To conclude their second turn, the red player chooses to generate its long-range air defense artillery to help provide missile defense against incoming aircraft and attacks. Both the token and squadron are now revealed at the red airbase. For blue's second turn, they choose to play their maritime missile defense enabler card, which generates one guided missile destroyer token to any range band. The Guided Missile Destroyer token is capable of conducting aerial and surface attacks as well as target acquisition. With its radar range of 2 and attack range of 3, Blue chooses to place it in range band 3, placing the entire board within air and ground striking distance. For the next step of their turn, Blue decides to conduct its first Move Acquire Shoot sequence. Blue declines any move actions and chooses to roll one die to attempt to acquire the H-6 bomber in the red standoff container using the attack UAS's radar. Since the attack UAS's radar offers no dice roll bonuses, and the H-6 has an acquisition value of 2 listed on the back of the token, the blue player needs to roll a 2 or higher to acquire the H-6. In this demonstration, they roll a 1 and do not acquire the H-6 this turn. Now, Blue decides to take the last action of the Move Acquire Shoot sequence to attack the Red Airbase using the Guided Missile Destroyer. Prior to the attack roll, Red declares Missile Defense to attempt to thwart the incoming attack using its long-range ADA. Blue now rolls two dice at disadvantage for both the attack and damage rolls. In this example, the Blue player rolls a 4 and a 3, taking the lower number. Since the Guided Missile Destroyer's ground attack value is a 2 with an exploding die icon, the strike is successful and Blue will roll two dice again at disadvantage to determine the damage. This time, Blue rolls two twos and can now place a total of two damage cubes on the main airbase. They choose to place both damage points against the H6 squadron and remove it from the board for scoring. Since any rolls less than 4 drive all assets except the attack UAS Winchester, the Guided Missile Destroyer runs out of ammunition for ground attacks after this turn, 
and Blue places a blue cube on the ground attack portion of the token. Blue's guided missile destroyer is unable to conduct further ground attacks, but still has salvos left for missile defense and aerial intercepts, and does not return to base during this ATO. This concludes turn two. For turn three, Red chooses to play their J-15 Squadron Enabler card, demonstrating a Red aircraft carrier's ability to generate four J-15 air tokens in any range band. Red places all four in Red Band 5 within striking distance of the Blue Air Base. Next, Red chooses to attempt their first Move Acquire Shoot sequence. Red declines their move option and chooses to use their ADA radar to attempt to acquire the blue attack UAS threatening its airbase. Importantly, the long range ADA token grants a roll bonus of plus one, meaning they add one to the number showing on the die. By rolling one D4, red rolls a three plus one or four exceeding the acquisition value of three listed on the back of the attack UAS token. One attack UAS is now acquired and may be targeted in future red attacks. Now, red chooses to use its H6 bomber to attack the blue primary airbase. Both attack and damage rolls are at advantage due to the red enabler card played during turn one. For the attack roll, Red rolls a 4 and a 1. Using the 4, since red is at advantage, the roll is greater than the 2 listed on the H6 token for ground attacks, meaning the attack is successful. Luckily, an attack value of 4 also prevents the H6 from going Winchester. Now, the red player rolls at advantage to determine damage, and rolls both a 3 and 1 again granting three damage points against blue squadrons. Red chooses to inflict two damage points to the attack UAS squadron and remove it for scoring, as well as one damage point to the non-generated B-52 squadron. Since all attack UASs are generated, they will remain in play until they are destroyed, they have to return to base for Winchester rules, or the end of the ATO. In any of these situations, they will be surrendered to red control for scoring. For Blue's third turn, they choose to play their EC-130 Compass Call Enabler card, generating a new aircraft token into Blue Band 1. This card forces any red attack rolls in the same band to be at disadvantage. Additionally, Blue decides to generate their squadron at the contingency location as their last action of the turn. Since the contingency location represents remote and dispersed locations throughout the globe, Blue must now roll one die to determine how many of the four available air tokens can generate, and how many will remain grounded for the remainder of the ATO. Blue rolls a two and generates two F-35 tokens to Blue Band 1. Turn 3 is now over. For turn 4, Red chooses to start by playing their diesel submarine strike against the blue guided missile destroyer. Since this is a single use card that can be used anytime, Red could have played this immediately after the guided missile destroyer token was placed on the board. The destroyer is automatically hit per the submarine enabler card and the destroyer token is surrendered to Red for scoring. Next, Red chooses to generate their J-20 squadron to Red Band 1 and ends their turn. For Blue's turn 4, they decline to play an enabler card and proceed directly into a Move Acquire Shoot sequence. Since the F-35 has a move range of two bands per turn, Blue's first action is to move one F-35 token from Blue Band 1 to Blue Band 3. Next, since the F-35 has a radar range of two, the blue player rolls one die to attempt to acquire the J-20 in blue band five. Since the J-20 is a stealth aircraft and the F-35 radar offers no acquisition roll bonuses, the blue player must roll a four to acquire the token. In this demonstration, the blue player rolls a three 
and the J20 cannot be attacked this turn. The blue player declines their attack option and ends turn 4. For turn 5, the red player begins by playing their Cyber Counter UAS Enabler card, which destroys enemy UASs equivalent to the current red cyber rate. Since the red cyber rate is currently at 2, two blue UASs are removed from the board for scoring. Now, since the move range of the J20 is also 2 bands per turn, Red chooses to move one J20 token from Red Band 1 to Red Band 3. Next, the J20 and Red Band 3 attempts to acquire the F35. Since the J20 has a plus 1 bonus to its acquisition rate, and the F35 has an acquisition value of 4, the red player must roll a 3 or 4 to acquire the stealthy F35. For this demonstration, the red player rolls a 2 with the plus 1 bonus, meaning the F35 is not acquired and cannot be attacked this turn. Lastly, the red player concludes their turn by using their H6 bomber to conduct another ground strike against the blue primary airbase. Since the H6 enabler card is still in play, the red player rolls two dice at advantage to conduct the attack and to determine damage. For this example, the red player rolls a 3 and a 1. Since the higher number is used and the ground attack value of the H6 is 2 plus, the attack is successful. Unlike the first turn, since the attack roll was less than 4, the H6 will now be Winchester and must return to base prior to the next turn. This can be shown by either placing a cube on the token or turning the token sideways to indicate it can no longer attack. Importantly, this token is still vulnerable to acquisition and attack until it is removed from the game board. Since the H6 ground attack has the exploding die icon, the red player rolls two dice again at advantage from the enabler card to determine damage. The red player rolls a 2 and 1 and chooses to place both damage points against the blue F-22 squadron that has yet to generate. Since the air tokens are grounded and the attack destroys their squadron, the card and all aircraft tokens are surrendered to red for scoring. Red's turn 5 is now over. For blue's fifth turn, they decline to play an enabler card. Next, Blue decides to generate their B-52 squadron to the standoff location. This ends turn 5. To start turn 6, the Winchester H-6 bomber must return to base, but their squadron was destroyed during Blue's turn 2. This means the H-6 token is surrendered to Blue for scoring. Red then decides to play their final enabler card, the Plan MC Raid Enabler card to attempt to conduct a special operations attack on the primary U.S. airbase with damage determined by rolling 1d4. Prior to rolling for damage, the blue player uses their AC-130 gunship enabler card, which can be played at any time to cancel the red soft card. Now, red decides to move a J-20 token up two spaces from red band 3 to red band 5. Next, the red player attempts to acquire the B-52 using the J-20 radar, which has a plus one acquisition bonus. Since the B-52 has an acquisition rate of two, and the J-20 radar adds one to any die roll, any and all rolls will meet or exceed the B-52 acquisition rate. So, the B-52 is automatically acquired by the J-20, and the token is flipped over. Lastly, the red player attempts to attack the B-52 using the J-20. Since Blue played the EC-130 enabler into Blue Band 1 on turn 3, and the J-20 is attacking from Blue Band 1, the red attack roll is degraded and will now be at disadvantage. For this demonstration, the red player uses two dice and rolls a 1 and 3. Since the air-to-air -air attack value of the J-20 is 2, and the lower die roll is used at disadvantage, the attack is unsuccessful. 
Since the attack roll was less than four, the J-20 is Winchester and must return to base on the next turn. Red's turn is now over. For turn six, the blue player declines to use an enabler card and chooses to conduct a standoff B-52 strike against the red airbase, leveraging its six-band range for ground attack. Fearing missile defense, the blue player uses their forward observer's enabler card, guaranteeing their next strike will hit the red airbase. Since no attack roll is needed because of the enabler card, and the B-52 token's ground attack value is listed with an exploding die icon, the blue player rolls 1d4 to determine how much damage the attack deals. In this example, the blue player achieves the best possible value of 4 and uses the 4 damage cubes to destroy the red ADA squadron and token, as well as the red J-16 squadron. Since only one die was rolled, and it is a 4, the B-52 does not go Winchester and may continue to fight. This marks the end of turn 6. To begin their 7th turn, Red must start by returning the Winchester J-20 to its airbase. Declining to play an enabler card, the Red player then moves one J-20 up two spaces from Red Band 1 to Red Band 3. Then. The red player attempts to acquire the EC-130 in Red Band 5 using the maximum range of the J-20's radar. Using only one die, the red player rolls a 3 and acquires the EC-130. Lastly, since the J-20 can only range 1 to attack aerial tokens, the red player attempts to attack the newly acquired EC-130 using a J-15 currently in Red Band 5. Since the EC-130 still forces PRC attack rolls within its band to disadvantage, the red player uses two dice and rolls a 4 and a 3. Using the 3, the strike is successful, but the J-15 is now Winchester. This ends the red turn. For their 7th turn, Blue declines to play an enabler card and moves an F-35 from band 3 to Blue band 5. Next, the blue player uses one die to attempt to acquire a J-20 using the F-35 radar. The roll is a 4, which matches the acquisition rate for the stealthy J-20. Lastly, the blue player attempts to strike the J-20 at the airbase using the F-35. Since the red ADA unit was destroyed in turn 6, the blue player rolls a single die to get a 4, meaning the strike is successful and the F-35 will not go Winchester. Since the F-35 does not have the exploding die icon for ground attack, the damage inflicted is automatically 1 and a damage roll is not required. A single damage cube is then placed on the J-20 squadron card because of the attack. This concludes turn 7. Red begins turn 8 by returning the Winchester J-15 to base. Since this token was employed using an enabler card representing an aircraft carrier and not a squadron card, the J-15 is removed from the board and does not count for the blue score. Next, Red chooses to move a J-20 token up from Red Band 3 to Red Band 4 and attempts to acquire a blue F-35 in Red Band 5. With the J-20's powerful radar and plus one modifier, the red player uses one die and rolls a two plus the bonus, but fails to reach the F-35 acquisition value of four. Lastly, the red player tries another attack against the blue B-52 squadron using a J-15 in Red Band 5. Since the EC-130 was destroyed in turn six, this attack roll is no longer at disadvantage and only one die is used. The red player rolls a 2, the minimum ground attack value for the J-15, inflicting one damage point against the card. Since a 2 was rolled, the attacking J-15 is now Winchester and must return to base next turn. For its 8th turn, Blue moves another F-35 up from Blue Band 1 to Band 3. Using the F-35 and Blue Band 5, the player rolls one die to attempt to acquire another J-20. Blue rolls a 4 and acquires a second J-20 in Blue Band 5. 
Then, Blue attempts an attack using an F-35 and Blue Band 5 to shoot a J-20. Since Blue played the improved munitions enabler card in turn 1, all air-to-air -air attack rolls are at advantage. Using two dice, the blue player rolls a 3 and a 1, exceeding the necessary air attack rating for the F-35. The hit is successful, the J-20 is destroyed, and the F-35 is now Winchester. This concludes turn 8. Red begins its ninth turn by returning the second Winchester J-15 from Red Band 5 off the board. Skipping the move step, Red uses a J-20 and Red Band 1 to attempt to acquire the Winchester F-35 prior to it returning to base. Using one die, the red player rolls a 3. With the J-20 acquisition modifier of plus 1, the J-20 successfully acquires the F-35 and the token is turned over. Next, the red player attempts to shoot the F-35 and Red Band 1 using the J-20 in the same band. Rolling one die, the red player rolls a 1. Since the J-20 air attack value is 2, this attack misses and the attacking J-20 is Winchester. This ends the red turn. For their ninth turn, Blue begins by returning the Winchester F-35 back to the contingency location. Then, Blue moves an F-35 from Blue Band 3 to Blue Band 5. Skipping the Acquire step, the Blue player chooses to attack the Acquired J-20 in Blue Band 5 using the F-35. Using two dice from the Improved Munitions Enabler card, the Blue player rolls a 3 and a 2, destroying the J-20 and driving the F-35 Winchester. This ends the ninth turn. For turn 10, Red declines to use an enabler card and decides to move a J-20 token from Red Band 4 back to Red Band 2, and then attempts to acquire an attack UAS in Red Band 1. Rolling a single die, the Red player rolls a 2 with the plus 1 bonus of the J-20 radar. The attack UAS is acquired and then turned over. Now, the red player attempts an attack on the standoff B-52 using a J-15 and Red Band 5. The red player rolls one die and gets a 3, destroying the B-52 and forcing the J-15 Winchester. This ends the red turn. For Blue's turn 10, the Winchester F-35 in Blue Band 5 returns to base at the contingency location. The blue player also declines to move or acquire this turn, opting to attempt an attack on the red airbase using an attack UAS. The blue player then rolls one die and only gets a one. Since the ground attack value for the UAS is three plus, the attack misses and the UAS is now Winchester. Remember, attack UASs only go Winchester with dice rolls of 1 or 2 as indicated with the infinity symbol on their token. This ends turn 10. To start turn 11, the Winchester J-15 and Red Band 5 will now be removed from the board, returning to the non-targetable aircraft carrier. The red player then declines to move or acquire, opting instead to target a blue attack UAS in Red Band 1 using the J-20 in Red Band 2. The red player rolls one die and gets a 4, meaning the attack is successful and the UAS is destroyed and the J-20 will remain in the fight. This concludes Red's turn. To start Blue's turn 11, the Winchester attack UAS returns to base and the Blue player is unable to take any further actions and states pass. Since both players have not agreed to pass sequentially, the game proceeds to turn 12. For Red's turn 12, they decline to move or acquire and attempt to target the Blue primary airbase using the last remaining J-15 and Red Band 5. Rolling one die, the red player gets a 1 and the attack misses. The final J-15 is now Winchester and must return to base next turn. This ends Red's turn. Blue again declares pass, bringing turn 12 to an end. To start turn 13, the final Winchester J-15 returns to the aircraft carrier and is removed from the board. 
Unable to mount any further attacks, the red player passes. The blue player passes one last time and the ATO is now over. Warfighters, are you ready to master the skies and dominate the Indo-Pacific theater? Prepare your strategies, harness the power of multi-domain warfare, and lead your forces to victory in Air Force Wargame Indo-Pacific. Good luck, and may the best strategists win.